I can say without a shadow of a doubt that the Soviet Union was very interested in UFOs. It would not be surprising if saucers had crashed in the Soviet Union. This is so far the best footage that of an alleged uh, crash UFO or a, a dead alien that I've seen so far. Fact one. For over five decades, Western governments have been collecting information on UFOs in strict secrecy. Fact two. So did their counterparts behind the Iron Curtain. Fact three, now that the Cold War is over, the truth is finally out. The notion that life from another world may have visited our own is an intriguing one. Many say that it is true and that documentation exists to prove it but that that proof has been kept hidden from the public for over 50 years. With the end of the Cold War has come some intriguing, if not surprising, revelations. Western governments, apparently, have not been the only ones gathering information on UFOs in brutal secrecy. Hello, I'm Roger Moore. Join us now as we embark on an amazing journey of discovery of international intrigue and possible interplanetary visitation. Join us as we search for the secret of the century. of Russia is overwhelming, even to those accustomed to the wide open spaces of America. Huge tracts of eastern Russia are still uninhabited, and it was in just such a region, remote and far from civilization, that something profound happened nearly a century ago. In the desolate Tunguska region of central Siberia in 1908, something fell from the sky and exploded on the side of a hill. This event triggered an enduring mystery that scientists are still unable to adequately explain. There have been other well-known cases of UFO phenomena, but it was the Roswell incident that changed the way that government officials thought about UFOs. Researcher Paul Stonehill has done extensive work chronicling UFO sightings in the former Soviet Union. I would say that the most serious research was uh, given the impetus by Stalin in the 1940s when he found out about Roswell. It was then that the KGB and the military separately had initiated studies of UFOs. The KGB, as far as we know, had never ceased studying them. This Soviet Air Force footage was obtained by a group of Russian ufologists. It was declassified by the USSR's Ministry of Defense just before Boris Yeltsin took power. What we are looking at is a view from the cockpit camera of a MiG-23 flogger, scrambled to intercept two unknown targets. What we see now is an apparent merging of the two targets. Here is the same shot slowed down. These are obviously not typical flight characteristics of NATO, or any other conventional aircraft. The MiG lost visual contact with this object or objects, and there has never been any official identification. By attending international conferences and exchanging information over the internet, researchers on both sides of the former Iron Curtain have been able to increase the global understanding of anomalous phenomena. Richard Haynes has been to Russia many times, and has worked with many of that country's researchers. Soon after the, the perestroika, the fall of communism, 
approximately 1990. Uh, I said to myself, uh, I, am, I think this is the right time to initiate uh, opening doors with the East, with people uh, on the Eastern Bloc, who are sitting on their own piles of data, but we don't know about it. Likewise, we're sitting on piles of data that they don't know about. And so I started corresponding with friends, and we formed this joint USA-CIS Aerial Phenomena Federation. And we're now serving a, a very positive role, which is information exchange. The next clip was shot from a MiG-25 Foxbat. And what we're about to see is actually an American F-16 Falcon about 200 meters away. What happens next is that a new object appears from behind the clouds that was not identified. The new object suddenly descends and disappears into the clouds. Once again, here is the American plane at the same altitude as the main. And now here is the object as it appears behind the F-16. And here it emerges from behind the F-16, then goes down and enters the cloud bank. As with all accounts or potential evidence of UFO encounters, researchers attempt to authenticate and verify related facts as much as possible. In general, the more spectacular the report, the more important the verification. I was intelligence officer for the Soviet military for over 30 years. My son is a pilot in the Russian Air Force now. I can say for certain that there were numerous occasions where Air Force and Navy fighter planes intercepted what we thought were NATO aircraft, only to find that they were not airplanes as we know them and not belonging to any nation on Earth. It's no secret we would send planes into their airspace, they would fly into our airspace. It's like a game, like a test, constantly trying to test the response of the other side. Only sometimes, someone would get shot at. In this case, neither the Soviets nor the Americans seem to have any clue as to what this third object is. I'm telling you, even when you blow it up, it's impossible to identify. It appears to be about four or five meters across, moves with characteristics unlike any conventional plane. Now, in this final piece of footage, we will once again be looking at a cockpit camera view, this time from a MiG-21. The camera plane and three others were scrambled to intercept an unknown craft flying at very high speed which is visible here as a large, cylindrical-shaped object. And as the Russian planes close in, the UFO suddenly picks up speed and disappears. Here it is once again. You'll notice the cylinder seems to be traveling at about the same speed as the MiGs until about here. And then it seems to increase its speed, which, according to pilots, must have reached at least Mach 3 in about 10 seconds. A lot of this footage was declassified after the Soviet military failed to identify the object seen here. This one shows an interception attempt by MiG pilots. There were many cylindrical object interceptions that were reported and investigated. We were interested in the high speed potential of these objects. The size of this one is estimated to be about twice the size of a MiG-21. With technology available to us and the Americans, it should not be able to move as fast as it does. Hey, this footage is still interesting because I don't think the Russians had any idea what they were dealing with here. Their fighters were at least as good as ours, and yet here is something that is completely beyond their capability to intercept. The acceleration rate of this thing is impossible for any aircraft that we know of. There was one tragic incident I know of occurring in the early 1970s in which MiG-21s tried to shoot down an unknown craft flying over Western Russian airspace, which failed to respond to Soviet pilots. The pilots used standard intercept procedure to expel foreign planes out of Soviet airspace. When the craft did not respond, the pilots were ordered to lock on missiles. At that point, both jets were destroyed by some weapon not known to Soviet military. Both pilots perished. There was an effort within the Air Force to make it look as if the fighter planes collided, but investigators I knew personally at the time said it was not collision. They were shut down by something. 
The NSA intercepted a radio transmission that we were copied on. Apparently, the Russians lost a couple of MiG-21s or 23s. They were trying to intercept something unidentified. All I know is it wasn't one of ours. You know, our department received a number of stories like this involving the Soviet military and UFOs. One of the most intriguing stories we came across was first told in the new book, UFOs in the USSR, by Russian author Veniamin Grigoryevich Vereshagin. He recounts the crash of an extraterrestrial craft and subsequent recovery by Soviet officials in the late 60s. Существуют свидетельства тому, что осенью 1968 года there is evidence to the fact that in the fall of 1968, there were reportedly a lot of UFO sightings in the area of Sverdlovsk, currently known as Ekaterinburg. On November 27, many residents of Berezovsky, Sverdlovsk area observed several fireballs moving across the sky. One of the balls began going rapidly down, and after that, there was a loud sound of an explosion. In a few days, a Sverdlovsk paper published an article which said that the explosion had taken place on a territory of a grain storage unit due to the carelessness of some workers. But the article also mentioned that the residents of this area had witnessed similar lights before that day. This is a copy of the Sverdlovsk newspaper from November the 29th, 1968. An article on the front page entitled Beyozovsky Dreams or what was that, gives the state sanctioned account of what could have been the actual crash. Translated, the Russian copy reads, five glowing balls of light appeared over the horizon and started to move in the direction of the city. Four of the objects moved in opposite directions while the fifth began to rapidly lose altitude and soon completely disappeared behind the forest terrain. Several seconds after its disappearance, there was a deafening explosion. And in typical Soviet fashion, the paper cites the official statement. The blast had taken place at the grain storage unit number 27. The explosion was caused by one of the employees who had violated a safety code resulting in a charge of negligence. He was sentenced to restitution of the material losses suffered by the state. What helps make the account in Bereshagin's book so compelling is the existence of several reels of film which seem to back up the story. While rumors of such film first began circulating some years ago, it was not until Bereshagin led us to the black market dealer in possession of these materials that we got our first look at what could be remarkable new evidence. If this film indeed corresponds with Bereshagin's story, what we are looking at is the scene of the crash site in Beryozovsky, as viewed by a camera on top of a military truck. The focal point of this scene is here, and indeed appears to be a disc embedded in the ground. Here we see soldiers exiting the truck, led by a captain. The troops are met by another officer, this one a major, and then they join other soldiers and officers already on the scene. This footage is one of four reels of film acquired during our investigation. The two groups that have without question been exchanging information freely are the Russian and Western ufologists. It's with a, a sense of full cooperation that much of the formerly sensitive information has surfaced. At one end of the spectrum, the simple UFO sightings, which are often accompanied by film or video footage, at the other end are accounts of actual contact with alien beings for which most bona fide researchers retain a healthy dose of skepticism. Interestingly, many psychiatrists and psychologists 
have placed considerably more credence in stories of alien abduction than ufologists. Though no such encounters have been officially reported in the former Soviet Union, and in spite of efforts by the government to deny their existence, documented cases do exist. Typically, the abductee reports seeing a blinding white light usually hovering high above. These abductees have reported under hypnosis that they feel compelled to approach the light as if they are somehow being drawn towards it. Some have reported seeing doors to the crafts actually opening for them. As with their reaction to the light, they feel compelled to walk through. Most abductees have not been able to describe the interiors of these crafts, other than recalling swirling mist and bright lights. Most reported alien abductions include harrowing accounts of medical experiments. Subjects describe an examination room of some kind. Many have reported strange probe-like tools being used on them, and they recall the frightening sensation of being examined, though simultaneously being unable to do anything about it. Typically, the abductees will then find themselves back where they were when they first saw the light, having no recollection of what just happened. Other times, however, upon checking their watches, they discover that several minutes have passed without their ability to account for it. They literally have lost time. Many abductees have their memories triggered by a mark found on their bodies, the kind they would associate with a needle or some other medical instrument. And not surprisingly, no such report has ever been verified 100%. And yet these stories continue to proliferate. Are these people really being abducted by aliens or, as some now claim, by members of a secret government agency? The austere building behind me once housed what was undoubtedly the world's largest and most feared intelligence agency. Why would the KGB be so interested in what many consider to be science fiction. From the beginning of the communist era, the Soviet leaders relied on a strong secret police to act as watchdog and often executioner for their rule. This was not a new concept for Russia. During the rule of Tsar Nicholas, the secret police was everywhere, its agents spying on everyone. There were agents watching every train station, hotel and theater. Shortly after the Russian Revolution, the first Soviet government approved the creation of their own secret police. It soon became a powerful mainstay of the Soviet system. To ensure the continuation of communist rule, the main domestic role of the secret police became to seek out counter-revolutionary views and ensure that those holding them were dealt with. After the death of Stalin in 1953, the secret police became known as the Committee for State Security, or KGB. As the Cold War heightened under Khrushchev, this was also the era that bolstered the growth of the KGB's image as an international spy agency. Foreign espionage was at its height. According to Western authorities, the KGB managed to infiltrate every major Western intelligence service. During the height of its existence, the KGB was the largest secret police and espionage force in the history of the planet, with more than 300,000 agents. Its body consisted of 17 separate units charged with such concerns as counterintelligence, foreign espionage, and internal security. The division known as the Scientific and Technical Directorate was the unit responsible for the acquisition of top secret technological information and materials, including those not originating on Earth. The government body that had the most interest in anomalous activity was very possibly the Soviet military. Did high-ranking officers of the Russian armed forces really believe they could gain a military advantage from UFOs? Though there has been much speculation on the exact nature of the Roswell incident and reports of actual alien beings, conclusive evidence of such encounters has proved elusive. In 1997, the U.S. Air Force issued a follow-up to its earlier Roswell report, which they subtitled, Case Closed. 
They try to account for the stories of aliens by suggesting these were simply crash test dummies misidentified. So it was with a sense of both excitement and caution that we examined the footage recently recovered in Russia. This reel contains images of what appears to be a scientific or medical examination of organic body parts. The individuals seen here appear to be forensic pathologists or biological research scientists. Speaking in Russian, they are seen inspecting the specimen, the leader of the procedure describing his actions and the measurements they are taking. After several minutes of this, there is a change in camera angles. Now we see the specimen being more extensively examined. Tools are used to cut open what the leader constantly refers to as tissue. He also describes parts that are removed as resembling various organs. The camera angle changes again. And finally, the scientists are seen posing for the camera, holding up various samples of the dissection. If this footage is authentic, it represents one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time. One must wonder where this film was shot and what happened to the specimen seen. If this is footage of a genuine scientific examination, what happened to the results? What did the Soviets learn and what have they done with that knowledge? Did agents of the KGB have reason to keep this secret for so many years? Certainly there are more questions here than answers. Russia has had countless UFO sightings. Some have been explained, some have yet to be explained. The best known events are the Darnogorsk and Tunguska incidents. Many UFO researchers feel that the most important Russian incident in terms of known crash recovered materials is the Dalnagorsk occurrence. Antonio Honeas agrees. It's uh, the best documented crash uh, because we do have the fragments. Uh, they have been analyzed. It was a small probe. It was not kind of a big object, but something crashed on a hill in Dalnagorsk in, in uh, January of 1986. Witnesses described the object as a sphere of light streaking across the Pacific region north of Vladivostok. Investigators later recovered materials including balls of lead and iron, bits of glass and a fine mesh netting, all of which were tested and are proven to be highly enigmatic. The head of the research team concluded that the Downagost object was most likely an artificial space probe of non-terrestrial origin. Russia's best known event the Tunguska sighting is sometimes referred to as the Russian Roswell. In the early hours of June the 30th, 1908, peasants of the Tunguska River area in central Siberia watched in disbelief as a glowing round object with a fiery tail streaked across the morning sky. The object crashed in a remote region of pine forest, exploding in a brilliant ball of flame. 
Residual firestorms lasted for weeks and destroyed an additional 10,000 kilometers surrounding the crash point. Although the event preceded the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by nearly 40 years, the aftermath of Tunguska was frighteningly similar to that of the bombings in World War II. The result was the destruction of an area larger than that of Los Angeles or Moscow. Oddly, upon investigation some 20 years later, no impact crater of any kind could be found. Researchers have formed various opinions of what actually happened. The most common beliefs are that it was a meteorite fall, a ball of lightning, or an earthquake. Many have cited that none of these answers are possible and that the phenomenon was more likely the crash of an extraterrestrial craft. It has been speculated that the governments of many countries throughout the world have been gathering information regarding UFOs. Nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman agrees. There's no question that military and intelligence groups overseas are collecting data, whether it's in Brazil or Australia or in England. So the KGB has collected information. I've talked to people who've gone to the Soviet Union who have obtained some of that information. I have met a Soviet cosmonaut and other researchers over there. There's no question they're interested. And again, the republics which used to constitute the Soviet Union cover a huge area. They too were monitoring the skies because they were afraid the United States was going to bomb them. So when you monitor the skies, you pick up UFOs. No question about it. During the communist reign, there was no official admission of Soviet interest in extraterrestrial activity. It has been only recently that this fact has been confirmed. The former secretary of the Commission on Anomalous Phenomena, Alexandra Petyukov, confirmed that an official state-controlled body did exist. In the this commission, when, of her during the Soviet era, we started to regularly collect information from the public and received more than 15,000 reports. The thing is that the Commission was an official public organization. It had an official address. Today, the mindset in Russia is far different from what it was during the communist reign. On the communism, they were told that UFOs didn't exist, but the just the fact that they were told they didn't exist made, made people believe that they did exist because the government was also denying they were saying there was no crime in Russia and uh, accidents didn't happen, you know, I mean, that everything was censored and given this rosy picture, which, of course, people knew better. It was in a small house on a side street near the Academy of Medical Sciences. The British and American spies met with informants throughout the 60s and learned of one of the most bizarre plots in the world of intelligence. During my involvement for a period of at least six years, Soviet counterintelligence operatives played cat and mouse with Western agents in Moscow who were interested in our advanced technology programs. Some new weapons and propulsion systems were being developed, and the CIA was using any means to get information from anyone involved with the project. Well, I was in Moscow for a year and a half. I had two other agents and a guy from the British Secret Service. We routinely debriefed two Russian informants who worked for the Ministry of Defense. We would exchange hard currency for information on new military technology. Some of this technology was definitely related to UFOs. One way we often dealt with such incursions was to feed false information through double agents to give American and British bad leads. Well, we knew the Soviets were onto something after we started getting all kinds of smokescreen intelligence. That was a sure signal that they were hiding something. It was an indication that they had recovered something near Sverdlovsk, and that they were keeping it very secret. Senior research scientist Dr. Richard F. Haynes believes the Soviets had good reason to be interested in UFOs. It's my understanding that the Soviet military has had a continuing interest in UFO phenomena for very, very many years. And the reason being that their air traffic controllers, their radar sites, their military pilots had been reporting things, just as ours had, 
and they had no explanation for them. And so the first uh, possible explanation would be that it's a foreign uh, nation um, test or uh, espionage or something like that of a military nature. And if you're in the military yourself, then you take that very seriously and you explore it. This film footage certainly seems to depict interest by Russian military personnel in the object that is seen sticking out of the ground. Soldiers, officers, and civilian clothed agents are deployed around the site, and they appear to be both guarding and examining the object. This is what we found on one of the four reels of film obtained in Russia. After viewing the footage, we were able to determine that it was most likely shot with two separate cameras, one apparently a handheld camera, which starts out on the approaching truck, and a second one seen here on a tripod. As the soldiers march past, you can see the cameraman turn to follow the troops. Here we cut to the other angle, the point of view from the tripod camera. And here you see the handheld camera as the truck pulls up. Both cameras change vantage point several times during the film, as if to get better views or perhaps under orders of a superior. From this angle, we see yet more troops arrive. Author Veniamin Vereshagin describes the event. Весной же 1969 года рабочий местного совхоза In the spring of 1969, a collective farmer found some strange remains in the forest not far from Berezovsky and reported that to the local security organs, who in their turn asked the neighboring military division of air defense troops, PVO, to provide assistance with the investigation. On March 1969, two KGB officers examined the discovery site and sealed it off. On the KGB request, a Soviet Army unit was brought to the discovery site after a close examination of the place, they found some wreckage debris of a disc-shaped object partially sunken to the ground. At first, the KGB thought that the debris came from an American spy in plane or a Soviet spaceship. George Feiler, a retired Air Force intelligence officer who was stationed at Langley, is not surprised the Russians were so interested in this object. We found that the Soviets would pay to get information on UFOs as opposed to, we'll say, an F-111 aircraft, that they were, in a way, more interested in UFOs than some of our latest aircraft. And here you see the man who is probably the head KGB agent directing the cameraman to point his camera toward the disc. A total of almost 1,200 feet of negative were recovered just on this crash site. It is possible that more film was shot, but this is all that we were able to obtain. None of this film depicts the removal of the disc itself, and at no point do we see inside the object. From this angle, we do see the handheld camera shooting behind or inside the disc. However, that footage, if it was in fact ever shot, was not included in the cans of film we acquired. We can only speculate that it may still be at large. We must also speculate on how the object ended up here. Based on information from Bereshagin's book and what we can see in this footage, we have created this computer animated version of how researchers believe the crash may have occurred. The questions then become, where did this object come from and how did it come to crash here? And more importantly, what has happened to it since? With the change to a market economy here, many items never before available to Russians are finding their way to store shelves. Some point to this as evidence of a new prosperity. Others claim that this only fosters greed 
not seen during the Soviet era. They say that everything is for sale in the new Russia, including state secrets and the spies who kept them. And I'm sure that this happened because I remember in 1991, 1992, there has been a lot of talk about the KGB files. It's quite possible that the files, some of the files, had been sold to the highest bidder. What is now modern-day Russia was once the core republic of the Soviet Union. Prior to its breakup in 1992, the USSR was the world's largest country, stretching from Eastern Europe into Asia. In addition, the USSR had direct control over the Eastern European countries of Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany. The boundary of these countries was for years referred to as the Iron Curtain. For decades, its military power influenced events throughout the globe. The single most important event in Russian history was the revolution of 1917. The Bolsheviks changed the country from a monarchy to the world's first communist state. In the late 1920s, Joseph Stalin transformed the country even more by regimenting every aspect of daily life and still managed to brutally stomp out his opposition. While the USSR was allied with the West during World War II, the years after the war ushered in an era of mistrust that came to be known as the Cold War. This new relationship chilled ever further in August of 1949 when the Soviets exploded their first atomic weapon. The Western powers, including the United States, viewed the USSR as the world's greatest threat. In its ongoing competition with the West, Russia's greatest victory occurred in 1957 under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev. It was the beginning of the space age. As the first nation into space, it's not surprising that in the years to follow, the Soviets would become increasingly curious about extraterrestrial life existing in our galaxy. Despite their early victory in the space race, back at home, the standard of living and the country's lacking economy weighed heavy on the minds of the Soviet citizens. Under Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s, the terms glasnost and perestroika came to represent a period of humanist reform. The first truly democratic elections in Russia's history occurred in 1991. After 70 years of Soviet rule, the USSR was dissolved. A new market economy has emerged along with more freedom for the people. While there are some who yearn for a return to communism, most citizens feel that the new Russian democracy has been a vast improvement to their daily lives. But with these positive changes come problems. In a recent news survey in Russia, citizens were asked the question, who controls Russia today? An astounding 23% responded the mafia. Renowned Russian writer and Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote Russia's economic chaos is the result of merely criminal reforms that have created a new class of mafia capitalists. The word mafia refers to the new system of organized crime in Russia involving countless government officials, businessmen, and organizations controlled by criminal groups. Resistance to extortion attempts has resulted in violence Kidnappings, assassinations, attacks on family members, or harsh persecution by corrupt government officials have been documented. Dozens of bankers were kidnapped and assassinated by the Mafia in the first few years of Russia's independence, when organized crime was taking control over the country's financial system. Having eliminated its rivals in such a brutal manner, the Russian Mafia is now in a position of great power. What the future holds for the Russian Republic is uncertain. What is certain? is that in the next Russian elections in the year 2000, the interests of big business and those with money will be well represented, and undoubtedly so will organized crime. Mafiocracy, as it has been called, might become the totalitarianism of the new millennium. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, many changes have come to Moscow and the rest of Russia. Gone is communism and the strict controls that once governed daily life here. 
Please understand, Russia has always uh, been a secret society. Just recently, we found out that uh, the uh, secret police had kept records on a UFO phenomena, and some of them had been released only recently. Some, not all, coming to light now. Case in point, the intriguing film footage we had acquired. Proof, some say, of alien visitation. Being that this material is of such sensational nature, we had many questions regarding its history. Little information was provided us by the black market dealer from whom the film was purchased. It is likely that such materials were kept stored in a holding facility, a vault located beneath KGB headquarters perhaps, reserved only for those with the highest level of security clearance. Kept safe in underground storage for decades, the film was probably only handled by a select few who would have known of its existence. After the collapse of the Soviet system, there was a transitional period marked by confusion. Accountability to the old regime dwindled and closely guarded property lay vulnerable to the changes sweeping through the crumbling union. Those with connections under the old regime found themselves perfectly positioned to exploit the situation. There was a lot of chaos when the Soviet Union you know, disintegrated. In my opinion, at that time, it was very easy for an you know, agent uh, with brains to get his hands on, on such files and sell them here. So it would be conceivable that documentation might be obtainable through similar sources to provide authentication of the film. Though most leads proved to be ultimately unproductive, we found that with perseverance, money, and a bit of luck, it is possible to acquire classified Soviet documents. Using a hidden camera, we recorded numerous meetings over a period of months in which we attempted to obtain relevant materials. This transaction between one of our Moscow contacts, an interpreter, and a local black market dealer proved to be one of the more successful ventures. The location of this meeting is a textile factory in the Sokolniki district of Moscow. This office is that of the Russian entrepreneur who owns the plant and is used for both legitimate and illegal business. After introductions and some initial small talk, the American buyer asks the interpreter if the documents are on the premises. The businessman tells him that he has had difficulty in obtaining the documents and the price has gone up. He is told that it is impossible to come up with any additional money. After consultation with his associate, the seller finally agrees to honor the original price. The files are then removed from a safe and given to the interpreter to inspect. This is the summary report about accident in Sedlock. 
Does, does this look? Do you think this is? Is it real? Просто хочет убедиться, что документы подлинные. Конечно. After inspection of the documents and a cursory verification of their authenticity, the transaction is completed. Okay, well, I mean, should pay, Mr. Chevron, and, uh, Money changes hands, and what was once property of the state now becomes much sought after evidence for UFO researchers. What made this transaction so successful was that among the pile of documents acquired, Several were extremely enlightening, including a top-secret KGB report on Operation Sverdlovsk Nidget and a request for military assistance from the Soviet Ministry of Defense. While the ability of Western governments to keep secrets is hotly debated, one thing seems certain. Behind the Iron Curtain, secrecy was standard operating procedure. Here, under the Soviets, freedom of the press and government accountability to the public were virtually non-existent. Many believe that the American government has had more than a casual interest in the possibility of extraterrestrial presence since early in the 20th century. Certainly since reports of flying discs in Roswell, New Mexico in the late 1940s, U.S. Defense Department and intelligence community involvement in the investigation of UFOs has been documented. Aside from the former Project Blue Book and two recent Air Force reports attempting to close the case on Roswell, there has been little made public by the government regarding its interest in UFOs. One organization that apparently did study UFOs was the Central Intelligence Agency. Since the Cold War era, it has been alleged that the CIA has actively sought after, on a priority level, the acquisition of any Soviet information that relates to alien contact and technology. One person who confirms such allegations is this man. An agent with the CIA for six years, his area of expertise was Russian interest in anomalous activity. Though now employed in the private sector as a security analyst, he has asked not to be identified due to the sensitive nature of both his former status and his current position. I joined the CIA in 1989, straight out of college. My mission was to monitor and infiltrate the special sciences section of the KGB, a unit of Directorate P, which was a division of the first chief directorate. The special sciences section's goal was to obtain analyze, interpret, and exploit any extraterrestrial knowledge. The Special Sciences Section was extremely interested in any number of reported UFO crashes over the former Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries. From the intelligence that our unit was able to obtain, uh, they had recovered at least one portion of a former crash site over the Soviet Union. This former agent was able to confirm interest not only in the 1968 crash near Beyozovsky, but in other Soviet attempts to recover UFO documentation and technology. Ever since Stalin had been in control of the, the Soviet Union, especially in the post-World War II years, he was determined that if there were any technological gains to be made from extraterrestrial technology, that the Soviet Union would be the sole possessor and sole beneficiary of those technologies. Due to the change of power in the former Soviet Union, many believe that much of the formerly unattainable information from the Cold War era may now be in the hands of the US and British intelligence agencies. Since the early days of the space race, the US and Russia made many independent breakthroughs. However, some of the new discoveries on both sides were undoubtedly obtained through old-fashioned spying and subsequent reverse engineering. Since the dawn of modern civilization, obtaining a rival's technology and adapting it to one's own uses have been the cornerstones of military and industrial espionage. This practice of dismantling another's hardware, discovering its secrets and adapting it has become known as reverse engineering. Since the infamous Roswell incident in 1947, it has been purported that the source of much modern US military technology has been not of this earth. A number of technologies were either partially inspired or wholly inspired from what was recovered at Roswell. 
It's amazing that when you look at the profiles from both the sides and from dead on, how close to stealth technology and spy plane designs that the Roswell ship resembles. We firmly believe that she is the design Rosetta Stone and the holy grail for aerospace design technology. According to witnesses and UFO researchers, debris supposedly collected from the site indicated a technology superior to any existing on Earth during the post-war years. The possibility exists uh, back in the 40s that uh, because the, all this new technology came out of Germany, we had scientists from uh, Germany that uh, either we were testing uh, uh, new advanced concepts to us at the time, these rocket engines, which were, were brand new to us, uh, or this was uh, some kind of uh, smoke screen, if you will, to hide uh, or to, to, to put the uh, Russians off guard, make them think we were further along uh, than we really were. And uh, there's been, a, you know, a history of misinformation uh, on both sides trying to uh, keep each other off guard. And that very likely is, uh, is, is one of the possibilities. Uh, if it wasn't Roswell, we're probably doing it some other place. Such advances as the Hubble telescope and the Super Arbeck missile engines are rumored to have benefited from alien reverse engineering. In addition to Roswell, there is another name heard frequently with regards to reverse engineering. The military facility located in the Nevada desert, commonly known as Area 51. One theory is that Area 51 is the hub of alien reverse engineering. But is the United States the only military power to have engaged in this secretive development of military technology? Or did Soviet military and intelligence organization reverse engineer technology from alien spacecraft that may have been recovered in Russia? Do the Russians have their own version of Area 51 located somewhere in the uninhabited parts of their vast country? Did the KGB, in addition to their agenda of maintaining the hard and fast rules of the communist regime, add to their duties the manipulation of alien technology for the advancement of Soviet power? Thus far, of all documented UFO sightings that have taken place within the former Soviet Union, not one was publicly acknowledged by the KGB. While reverse engineering remains a common practice throughout the world, not only in the military, but industry as well, the question as to whether or not it has ever been used to obtain alien technology remains unanswered. If the Russians had in fact recovered an extraterrestrial vehicle as they seem to be doing in this footage, they no doubt would have wanted to benefit from its technology. We invited ufologist Stanton Friedman to view the recovered footage and to give us his input. It would not be surprising if saucers had crashed in the Soviet Union. And if somebody had monitored this on radar or from whenever, satellites, we had satellites, they had satellites at that time, or just a report from a local person. And the kicker is the fact that you get troops out there and a cameraman doesn't necessarily mean it's a flying saucer. We need to be a little cautious about jumping to conclusions. Now, I think that film is worth a detailed investigation. Those things cost a lot of money, actually, to go over it. You have different specialists looking at it. You know, are the, are the uniforms correct for the time frame? Is the film actually made in the Soviet Union? We asked Russian film expert Sergei Goncharov to examine the film for its authenticity he first explained the background of the film cans. And uh, this is the name of the factory uh, that manufactures the motion picture film in the city of Pereslavy. This is the type of film type A2, which is the emulsion. After Sergei examined the cans, he felt that they were authentic and consistent with the area and time period from which they had allegedly come. Now that we've looked at the cans, the next thing to do was to actually find out if, if the film itself had any markings on it. Okay, in the very beginning of the film, we have this word, which in Russian says machala, or the beginning, or the start. Now, the next bit of information are these two items. 
M-A-R-T, Mart, which is the month of March, 1969, letter G for year. So the year of 1969, the month of March. Okay, then we have the two bits of information which says plyonka number 267. Plyonka in Russian means emulsion or film could denote the reel, the roll, or a batch, and this, of course, is the number. The next thing we see is this bit of information. Savershena Sekretna, top secret archive of the KGB logo and the word archive of the KGB. Finally, Sergei Goncharov compared the markings on the film itself to what was printed on the cans. As you notice right here on the edge of the negative, we have the word bezapasne plyonka, meaning safety film, and tip A2, or type A2, which is exactly the information that you have on a can. Next, we showed the film to Russian researcher Paul Stonehill. The colors of the film, the quality, uh, soldier uniforms, uh, somebody would have to go into, de into special, to make a special effort to make a film that feels like uh, something that was making, made in the 1960s. I've seen a lot of films made in the 1960s, and uh, this film here is almost of the same quality. It's not a 1980s or 1990s film. The KGB officer that had been looking and uh, touching things looks quite genuine. To me, my gut feeling is this is not uh, something that they had ma made intentionally to fool people. UFO researcher Antonio Huneas offered us his views on the film. I would say that uh, visually it's very impressive. Uh, the first thing that struck me was the, the good quality. A very, very, very clear uh, footage. Um, you see, uh, of course, it wouldn't be impossible to, to, to duplicate, you know, as a hoax. Uh, you would have to hire some actors and so on. Uh, but but it, was, it was quite well done. Of course, it could even be some kind of um, disinformation, too, that the KGB was quite notorious about doing disinformation. For what purpose, I don't know, but they might have done some kind of training film or something to... Of course, if it was disinformation aimed against the Americans or something, we never heard of it. So that's, uh, that, that's also, also dubious. Finally, while Mr. Hanez felt that the film required more investigation, he was impressed and intrigued by it. Well, uh, I would say that uh, if this is real, and I do not have uh, the elements to, to make that, that judgment, uh, this is so far the best footage that of an alleged uh, crash UFO or a, a dead alien that I've seen so far. To appreciate the difference in attitude here with respect to such unconventional science as the study of UFOs, it is important to understand some of the cultural contrast between Russia and the West. For hundreds of years, Russian culture has been steeped in religion, mysticism, and superstition. In the times of the Tsars, it was not uncommon for there to be an official court mystic, the most famous of these being the priestly soothsayer Grigory Rasputin during the reign of Tsar Nicholas. Even though religious expression was suppressed, it is now making a resurgence, and the many places of worship in Russia are once again housing congregations and becoming a big part of daily life. Russians seem to have an open-minded attitude towards the paranormal and such unconventional sciences as the study of UFOs. During the Soviet era, some of those voicing their beliefs in extraterrestrials were subjected to criticism and censure by Soviet officials. Russian author Yuri Alexandrovich Fumin claims that he has had such experiences. I was summoned to the regional party committee and asked to deliver a lecture on UFOs for the employees of various scientific research institutions. I agreed. After that lecture, the head of the regional party committee suggested that everyone present should take a stand and subject my lecture to criticism. But that didn't happen. All the people who listened to my lecture would say, this is sort of interesting, this needs to be studied and examined. 
And then the head of the party committee said, you're here to express your agreement with the official reaction to this kind of lectures. And you instead are trying to make sense out of the facts. While the communists said they weren't interested in UFOs, many around the world were. Some claim that sightings date back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Much like their American counterparts, many modern Russian citizens are very open to the possibility of the unusual. Many people become victims of tabloids, like, like Americans today. However, so much information had been collected, and people read about it in underground magazines, have heard about it, that they, they believe in the extraterrestrial explanation of UFOs, not so much time travel, but as the extraterrestrial. And people in Russia also are more cynical than the Americans in their ap approach to information, simply because everything was a lie. Both Americans and Russians believe they have been lied to by their government about many things, including extraterrestrial research. When Russian researchers headed by former Soviet naval officer Vladimir Shazha petitioned the Soviet government for official records regarding UFOs, they too were met with a lack of cooperation. We sent an inquiry to the archives of the Ministry of Defense and to the archives of the KGB. We got a response that neither KGB archives nor the archives of the Ministry of Defense have any data regarding this incident. If there is mistrust of the government by Russian and American citizens, it's not without good reason. For Russians, it was more than 70 years of communist rule. For Americans, there has been a steady erosion of trust over the last 30 or 40 years. For Americans, the knowledge that their government was not being honest began in the 1960s, when the war in Southeast Asia escalated with secret bombing campaigns in Cambodia. In the 1980s, arms were sold to support the Contra anti-communists in Nicaragua, in violation of US law and without public knowledge. God bless America. It's no wonder that many American and Russian citizens doubt the honesty of government officials. How paranoid is the belief that their governments could withhold knowledge of extraterrestrials? Despite officially denying interest in the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation, the governments of both the US and the Soviet Union have without question been interested in what lies beyond our own planet. Man has always been intrigued by the notion of life elsewhere in the galaxy, and both the American and Russian space programs represent a considerable investment to explore the unknowns of our universe. At the close of the Second World War, the United States, now the preeminent world power, turned its eyes from defeating Hitler's Germany to a new rival, the Soviet Union. With Russia's detonation of its own atomic bomb, the United States realized they now had an enemy who wielded the same degree of power. During the Truman administration, loyalty oaths taken by government employees became a common practice which would eventually lead to the ugly communist witch hunts of the House Un-American Activities Committee. Winston Churchill's pronouncement that Eastern Europe was now behind an iron curtain gave birth to a new term for this confrontation between East and West, the Cold War. With fear dominating the United States, paranoia over potential communist influence took the form of weird invaders from other planets. The possibility of a Soviet invasion was too frightening to contemplate. Helmeted men from Mars launching an all-out attack on Earth, however, was another matter. Therefore, Americans retreated to dozens of science fiction films that were thinly veiled warnings against the Red Menace. With Chuck Yeager's historic flight that broke the sound barrier, the next frontier to conquer would be the stars. This set off a global competition between the world's superpowers as to whom would get to the heavens first. It became known as the Space Race. To meet the demands of such technology, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was formed in 1958. The space race 
would nearly end in defeat for the United States, however, with the launch of Sputnik. The US feared if the Soviets could launch a probe in space, would missiles launched from that probe be far behind? When cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin made his historic orbit around the Earth in 1961, he became the first man in space. The United States realized their only hope of beating the Soviets was to have the first man on the moon. And in this dream, they would find a passionate champion. It was President John F. Kennedy's promise to have a man on the moon by decade's end that shot the space race into another dimension. It would not be until Neil Armstrong's historic first lunar step on July the 29th of 1969, however, that Kennedy's dream would be fulfilled. In years to come, the cumbersome NASA rockets would give way to the more streamlined and modern space shuttle. Even before the fall of communism, a new unity would develop between Russia and the United States. The petty rivalries of the past gave way to a new cooperation which would culminate in the joint Russian and American crew of the space station Mir. Modern astronauts like Dr. Michael Fowl would make history working with their Russian counterparts in space. At long last, the demons of the Cold War had been silenced. The first human beings in space were Soviet. Were the Russians also among the first to encounter beings not from this Earth? This footage, which seems to depict Russian pathologists dissecting what appears to be a non-human life form, requires further analysis. We once again asked Stanton Friedman for his comments. I don't know what to make out of it. I'd certainly say it's worth further investigation. By my standards, it's in my gray basket. Not black, not white, maybe. Worth following up on. We then asked film expert Sergei Goncharov if he thought that the film's characteristics on this reel were consistent with the time period from which it was supposedly shot. It certainly is consistent with the information on the can. It is negative. It's got the negative perforations. It's exactly what the information on the can indicated. Sergei explains the significance of a flash frame an interesting and possibly important characteristic of the film that was discovered. All right, now, uh, a flash frame, this is, of course, a flash frame is that piece of film that is when you push the button on the camera and you start exposure and you stop the camera to stop the exposure, and then you restart the camera again. By virtue of inertia, the camera will sometimes expose either a flash of light or if you point the camera away from the person in front of it, you will see some other subject matter. Those flash frames appear between the takes and sometimes show things and people that are not part of the scene itself. You have people that have nothing to do with the information that you've seen on a film before or after. Again, an individual in uniform. You see these people performing a procedure. You have somebody in civilian clothes, people that you have not seen before as this is in a flash frame segment, which was not meant to be as the procedure that was being photographed. Mr. Goncharov concludes that while the film stock and camera techniques are consistent with KGB and Soviet government films of that period, he feels that the discrepancies with the subject matter require closer scrutiny. Any time you have subject matter of this type, any additional investigation is worthwhile. Absolutely. Stanton Friedman was further intrigued by the medical techniques in the film. I don't know what to make of these guys with what seem to be medical instruments, certainly in a medical facility, judging by the stuff on the wall. And it's interesting that you can see their faces, which is interesting from two different directions. You can tell their identity if you could find people that look like that. And they're apparently not afraid of contamination, ingesting anything toxic. Now, that could be that they'd already gone through this routine and somebody had said, hey, th there's nothing bad here. We then showed the film to Dr. Annette Ryan, a former lieutenant colonel with the Army Institute of Pathology. The first thing that I notice is the way the doctors are dressed. They're dressed in these... Um pristine white lab coats and I I think it would be more common for them to be dressed in scrubs or even 
butcher aprons. Unless, of course, they um, know that they're being filmed and they want to look good. They uh, also look very young. But that is consistent with forensic examinations. And, and that's because senior medical staff usually don't get involved in this type of procedure. I also notice that they're wearing rubber gloves, but um, they're not wearing any other protective gear. They're not wearing goggles. They're not wearing masks. They're certainly not wearing any biohazard suits. I would assume that's because they're not concerned with contamination. And this, of course, is typical of Russian Soviet medicine. I mean, when we think of Chernobyl, just remember back that there was a terrible lapse in, in any type of protection. It certainly would not happen in the United States. I mean, it would be unheard of. Next, Dr. Ryan commented on some of the specific medical procedures. All right, what's happening here is that they're using dissecting scissors to open up the sternum, which is a common procedure at that time. He's using the proper tool. The way they're holding and using the various tools looks correct, which indicates to me these people know what they're doing. I would say there's little doubt that these are actual Russian medical people. Now, if you look closely at this procedure here, which is repeated several times in this footage, what they're doing is removing a piece of material. The one doctor refers to it as an organ or resembling an organ. Then the dean or sniffs off a small sample, which is placed in a specimen jar for later analysis. Well, that's exactly what would be done in a forensic case or in the case of scientific research, for instance, if, if some new species had been discovered. They would remove very small pieces for later chemical and microscopic examination. The lead doctor also mentions a structure he describes as resembling ribs. And here you can see what indeed resembles a rib cage as if this was the torso of some anthropoid or, or human-like organism. Finally, though Dr. Ryan was unable to identify the subject matter, she believes that the techniques were consistent with those practiced in the Soviet Union during the late 1960s. We have little information about the specimen seen here other than the pathologist's description and the KGB code name Sverdlovsk Midget. We wondered, though, how such a being might appear had it been recovered intact. Using only the images recorded on this film and the scant data available, technicians have constructed this 3D computer-generated model. Thus, with a bit of imagination and some forensic speculation, we have recreated what may have been the Soviet's possession of an actual being from another world. Information leaked from intelligence sources in the West indicated a belief that the Soviets were actually attempting to reverse engineer something not manufactured on this Earth. Whether we'll ever know the full truth about the supposed UFO crash in Beyozovsky, one thing seems certain. If agents of the KGB or any other branch of the Soviet government did recover parts of a craft made by alien beings, they would have been extremely interested in examining all the materials very closely. No doubt Soviet scientists would have wanted to determine if the parts of the craft were truly of extraterrestrial origin. They would have inspected each piece down to the microscopic level and tested for various physical and chemical properties. And of course, they would have wanted to take advantage of any new technology they could gain from the recovered materials. We are unable to solve the puzzle of their physics. Our physics is based on quantum mechanics. Theirs is based on parallel worlds, a different kind of paradigm, a different understanding of history. It is similar to the effect of a TV set or a video camera would produce on people in the time when Pythagoras lived. Pythagoras would not understand it. That is the gap between them and us. That's why, however hard our engineers or technicians would try to decode their technologies, they would fail. Back in the West, not only did the military consider UFOs a serious subject, but the Soviets' interest in them as well. 
It seems that, in the beginning anyway, both sides thought the flying saucers were an invention of the other. And that fueled a decades-long campaign of espionage and counter-espionage. Many believe that U.S. intelligence agencies such as the CIA, NSA, and the military have not been completely forthcoming with information regarding extraterrestrials. The same is apparently true of the KGB. Some claim that the KGB, as well as the U.S. government, may have been using the UFO phenomenon as a smokescreen to cover other top-secret activity from the very beginning. Former NASA scientist Dr. Richard Haynes concurs well, all I can say is that there, there are verified documents from Stalin's time that showed he had an intense interest in Roswell, what was going on in Roswell, New Mexico in about 19, mid 40s. Well, that makes very good sense from the standpoint that uh, that's where our atomic bomb group was, 509th bomb group, uh, from which you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki events happened, uh, ultimately. That's where the pilots trained. So it's understandable that Moscow would be very interested in this subject from that standpoint. Uh, if UFOs are a cover, they have been used very effectively uh, by both sides. So it's to the convenience of the Russian government, Soviet government, to continue the charade. It can be considered a form of disinformation. There is an alternate theory regarding UFO disinformation. Many researchers believe that the government may be intentionally drawing attention to the less credible, self-proclaimed ufologists as a means of lowering the perceived credibility of all UFO research. Alien abductees and conspiracy theorists are most often the least believable, and at the same time, the most visible. Russian rock and roll singer Natalia Medvedeva claims to have known several people that have had contact with aliens. One guy died, another got paralyzed. The third one became a heroin addict and could not overcome it. Sergei Borisovich Proskuryakov is a Russian researcher who has studied anomalous phenomenon and pyramidal constructions his beliefs may also seem unconventional. When I lived in Minsk, a KGB officer came to see me. He filmed all the documents I had. I couldn't escape anywhere. I believed they ended up in the KGB archive. I have information that my researchers of interest not as much for KGB or CIA as for presidential structures in the USA. Are individuals like these truly informed? Or, as some believe, convenient foils for government agencies with an agenda of suppression? Either way, their outspoken beliefs serve to discourage further investigation and make it much easier to simply write off any UFO account or evidence as nonsense. Most genuine researchers, however, believe it is imperative that all potentially genuine encounters with extraterrestrial intelligence be studied carefully. If something not from this Earth had been recovered, it would have been brought to a classified military base high in the Ural Mountains, where super-secret operations have been conducted since the Second World War. This incredible footage depicts members of the Soviet Armed Forces and what are believed to be two KGB agents inspecting and recovering a crashed flying saucer. Russian author Venyamin Vereshagin has an idea of the final outcome of this operation. As far as I know, the debris and their organic parts were taken to Mitishi, where the apparatus was disassembled, analyzed, and then back engineered. As for organic parts, I heard they were taken to Moscow. What happened afterwards, I don't really know. His story seems to be backed up in part by one of the people who claims to have been involved in the operation back in 1969. We found ex-KGB staffer Pavel Alexandrovich 
Tremchenkov, living in seclusion in the Bryansk region of central Russia. He remembers the strange wreckage found in Beryozovsky. At first, everyone believed that those debris were parts of some novelty aircraft manufactured in the United States or England. But having done some measuring and material analysis, we came to the conclusion that none of the domestic or foreign manufacturers known to us could have produced this apparatus, at least not in the conditions existing on this planet. It was then that an order came to transport the debris to the base in Mitishi near Moscow. Together with several other officers, I was assigned to provide safety and security to these materials during their transportation. In attempting to verify the authenticity of this evidence, we have had the footage and the film itself examined by several experts. We also carefully studied the documents we had procured, which lent further credibility to what we had been told. Among the most telling was this top-secret KGB report, specifically referring to Operation Sverdlovsk Midget, and describing in detail the recovery operation at Beryozevsky. This document mentions the crashed disk, the organic remains, and the filming itself. There was also this secret order from the Soviet Ministry of Defense, requesting assistance from military unit 67527. We looked closely at such elements of the footage as the uniforms and the arm patches worn by the soldiers. These patches seem consistent with the patch worn by such Soviet Army Air Defense Companies as military unit 67527. They're all wearing winter coats, which um, don't appear to have much in the way of insignia on them. And that, that is not out of character for the winter coats. Uh, they would generally not contain much in the way of identification. These are all members of the same unit. I can see that the weapons are AK-type weapons. The main battle weapon of the Russian army, even up through today's date, is the uh, Avtomat Kalishnikov weapon. Yeah, it's clearly an AK, fixed stock, birch stock, no muzzle brake, milled receiver, no question about it. It also seems to be consistent with the muzzles of the weapons that I can see in, these, in this film. In addition, we had notes from the scientific examination of the recovered organic specimen, which seemed consistent with the soundtrack of the dissection footage. With so many elements in seeming consistency, Vereshagin's story becomes even more tantalizing and perplexing at the same time. Is it possible the Russians actually recovered an alien craft and its occupant three decades ago? If members of the Soviet army had knowledge of a supposed UFO crash, then what happened to these individuals? And if they can't be found today, why not? In the course of our investigation, our goal was to follow every lead, to search for every scrap of information regarding the incident so named Operation Zverdlovsk Midget. The tenuous paper trail we have reconstructed using recovered government documents led us eventually to a lab of the former All Union Scientific Research Institute of Biology. In attempting to obtain records on the individuals depicted in the dissection footage, we turned up these additional documents. Three death certificates, all dated March the 24th, 1969, within a week after records indicate the examination was performed. Cause of death for all three, cerebral hemorrhage. Dr. Ryan told us that the odds of this occurring naturally are next to zero. The former state-run institute is now a private teaching center known as the Moscow Medical Institute. That this is the same facility as seen in the film footage becomes obvious with a comparison of such fixtures as the stonework tables and the distinctive tiling on the floors. The difference is 
that one-time experimental procedures have been replaced by routine anatomy lessons with plenty of hands-on experience, secretive operations are now openly administered educational opportunities. But we did find in the basement of the building remnants of this facility's past, reminders of a time when procedures here were not open to the public or subject to public scrutiny. What were the Soviets experimenting on in decades past at the Research Institute of Biology? The answer to that question is still yet to be found. Indeed, many questions about the film footage and the alleged Operation Sverdlovsk midget remain unanswered. Any extraordinary find, such as the apparent film record of a crashed spacecraft, or of what appears to be scientists examining parts of an alien life form, require further analysis. Yet it seems incredible that so many elements of this story from so many diverse sources appear consistent. The original account is told by researchers and witnesses, the recovered documents, and of course, the film. We have to ask, is this footage genuine? And if so, does it represent an actual case of alien visitation or, as it has been suggested, was the footage created as part of a Cold War disinformation campaign? One other proposed possibility is that it was simply a military training exercise captured on film. Again, if it is a real UFO crash, where are the remnants? and what happened to the body of the alien being. With all that we have unearthed here, the big question seems to be, what is the significance of what are clearly some very profound discoveries? And will we ever know the full story? We hope you've enjoyed visiting Russia with us, and we hope you've gained some insights on what promises to be a continuing source of intrigue and controversy. Thank you for joining us. I'm Roger Moore in Red Square.